Okay. Okay, everyone, we're going to get started since it's 12.20 now. So on behalf of Law Students for Reproductive Justice, APALSA, SALSA, and the Human Rights Law Society, we'd like to welcome you all today. Um, we have a really interesting topic, and we've brought in leading economists, um, policy experts, advocates uh, to uh, speak with us today. So I'm going to hand it over. What's going to happen is the panelists are going to speak for about 40 minutes, and then we're going to have 20 minutes of questions. So keep that in mind. Um, I'll hand it over to Professor Palantri of the International Human Rights Clinic. So join me in welcoming everybody. Thank you, Marlo, and thank you to all of the student organizations who co-sponsored this event. Uh, this student engagement is what I think makes University of Chicago a vibrant and exciting community to be a part of. Um, I will briefly just uh, introduce the panelists. Today uh, we have Sujatha Jettison, who is here from uh, San Francisco. She's an assistant professor at the University of California, um, San Francisco, and she is one of the national leaders on health and reproductive technologies issues. Um, we're, uh, we'd like to welcome Miriam Young, who is the executive director of the National Asian Pacific American Women's Forum. Her organization is taking the lead on addressing sex selection abortion bans across uh, the various states in the U.S. Uh, we have with us by Skype Arindam Nandi, who is a, an economist and fellow at the Center for Disease Dynamics, Economics and Policy in Washington, D.C. He worked with us to analyze birth statistics and understand sex selection from an empirical perspective uh, in the U.S. Uh, we also have Kelsey uh, Stryker, who is a third-year law student uh, at the University of Chicago Law School and has been a member of the Human Rights Clinic team uh, for the last year. And uh, to my right is Brian Citro. He's a fellow in the International Human Rights Clinic. So today's discussion is the culmination of a year-long project undertaken by the International Human Rights Clinic, together with the National Asian Pacific Women's Forum and the Bixby Center of Global Reproductive Health at the University of California, San Francisco. One of my goals for the International Clinic has been to use interdisciplinary and scholarly approaches to understand and design solutions to human rights issues. This project is culminating in a report that will be released shortly, which is based on empirical analysis of census data, comparative international research done by students like um, Kelsey and Jeff Gilson, and we have working with us Bill Watson and Marlo and Lindsay, who've put in an enormous uh, number of hours and effort in this project. So eight states have enacted laws prohibiting sex-selective abortion. 28 states and the federal government have considered these laws since 2009. We analyzed legislative history of sex selection abortion bans and realized that many of them are being adopted on the basis of misinformation. The report hopes to debunk many of the myths that are present and present facts in their place. Today's panelists will go through the six myths that are presented in this report. I'll start with questions for Sujata. So Sujata, from the legislative testimony, it is clear that people conclude that male biased sex ratios are proof that sex selective abortions are occurring. Can you please um, explain what sex selection is, um, how empiricists determine whether or not it is occurring, and the various technologies that are used to perform sex selection? Sure. So um, I want to start out by uh, thanking you all for participating in this conversation. And I want to welcome you to really what I consider one of the most ethically and politically and legally challenging issues that we face in the field of reproductive rights these days. Um, so when people talk about sex selection, these are two words that are really packed full of a ton of information. There's both technical information in terms of the medical procedures, but people have all kinds of assumptions and connections that they make when they hear these two words. And so at a technical level, what sex selection means is that people are doing, they're doing some intervention to ensure that they have the child of their desired choice. And that, particularly when it comes to sex. So there are several ways, there's, there are three different phases in which this uh, intervention can happen. The first is a preconception phase, so this is before a woman is pregnant. And this, there are a couple of technologies here that are used, and these are the more sort of cutting edge technologies. One is a sperm sorting technology, 
where sperm is sorted into X and Y chromosome, and then an egg is fertilized using the desired X or Y chromosome, sperm containing that. The second is called pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, and this once again is used in the context of IVF, in vitro fertilization, where an egg is fertilized in a petri dish, and at three days a single cell is extracted, they do an analysis in terms of the embryo, whether it is a male or female embryo, and then only implant the desired embryo. Um, so that's the second way. Uh, that's the second technology in terms of the preconception methods to be used. The second phase is uh, sex selection that happens while a woman is pregnant. And there are a couple of different ways of determining the sex when a woman is already pregnant. The first one is the sort of the well-known ultrasound, where in the second trimester, take an ultrasound, the ultrasound technician tells you is your child male or female, and then if it is of the undesired sex, you can elect to have an abortion. Um, there are a couple other sort of prenatal testing that can be done, and then the most recent technology that is becoming more consumer oriented is a technology where they take a, essentially a drop of maternal blood and you can test that blood for the sex of the fetus. And once again, once you determine what the sex is, electing to have an abortion, um, depending on what the outcome is. And then the third one, and this is the one that people often think about when they think about sex selection, um, is a much more traditional and old practice, practice where once a child is born, if it's of the undesired sex, sort of through neglect, you know, lack of medical attention, lack of nutrition, essentially allowing the child to die out or actually killing the child. So those are the three phases in which it happens. In the US context, oftentimes sex selection is really thought of as a practice that happens in other countries. It's seen as this sort of a more traditional patriarchal practice. There's a kind of a yuck factor kind to it of like, oh, you know, sort of civilized people don't do that. But what's interesting about what's happening in the United States is both with the technological changes in terms of preconception or the maternal fetal blood test, like these technologies are becoming much more present in the United States and so that there's an increasing <coughs> consumer demand for them. Um, and implied in all of this, so when people tend to think of sex selection, they tend to think of selecting for boys and against girls. So it's seen as a sexist and patriarchal practice. But really, the term itself implies that you could select either for boys or for girls. And many people are troubled by this in part because it reinforces a gender binary, where you're choosing for a girl or choosing for a boy based on some stereotypical notions of how girls will behave and how boys will behave, right? So boys might be more sporty and girls might be, you know, they might like the color pink more. So whatever those stereotypes are, that's what drives the, the selection process. And I just want to, one thing I want to clarify also is just the distinction between sex and gender, which is gen, gender is a spectrum. People are all, you know, in all kinds of different places around that spectrum, but the technology is really just to choose for sex, which is a biologically based. Um, and then the last thing I will say, there's always a question of do we know, how do we know that sex selection is happening? And um, the only, given that most reproductive decisions are personal and intimate decisions, the only measurable way that we know that sex selection is happening or that we can impute that sex selection is happening is by looking at sex ratio disparities at a population level. And this is essentially looking at the sort of sex ratio at birth. So um, research has shown that the standard sex ratio at birth is that 1.03 to 1.07 males are born for every female. So there already is a built-in sort of disparity in terms of what is considered a standard or natural sex ratio. And so when we see skewed sex ratios in a population, and this once again is at the population level, people assume that some kind of intervention has happened that creates that skewed sex ratio. But what we are finding out, and this is as both we're trying to figure, and you'll hear this more in the report, is just that there have been places and incidences where there has been a skewed sex ratio, but where one could also assume that some sex selective practice is not happening, so we don't quite know what's happening there. It might be, of un the skewing might happen for unknown reasons or for biological reasons, we don't know yet. Um, and the other assumption that is often made, and this is where the political debate sort of really comes in, is oftentimes people just assume that all sex selection is happening through sex selective abortions. 
And so the, the, all of the abortion, the contested abortion politics starts um, intersecting with this issue. And then the last thing I'll say is, um, and this is part of the work that I do, is that while sex selection has been a historical issue and now increasingly a current issue based on the legislation in the United States, there is also a long-term issue to be thinking about, which is that can, can, do our policies and our practices around sex selection create a gateway to future genetic trait selection? So as you think about the genetic developments in genetic technologies and the ability to increasingly select against disability, start selecting for particular traits, is this the gateway technology and the, are, do we set in place gateway policies around designer babies? So there's both the, this is what the immediate ethical and political challenges around this issue and the long term. Thank you. So um, Sujata, I think one, this is a great uh, comment and I wanted to emphasize also one thing I think that comes out of your discussion which is that um, even though people conclude from sex ratio skews that abortions are causing them, I think it's clear from what Sujata is saying that we don't know that it's abortion. It could be pre-implantation technologies that people are using to sex select. Um, with that, I actually wanted to turn to Arindam, who is an economist who worked with us on the report. He uh, did a study of all of the law of two laws that ban sex selection. So one in Illinois and Pennsylvania. Our state is the first to have adopted a sex selection ban in 1984. Pennsylvania adopted one in 1989, which is stands in stark contrast to sort of there was a gap then of 15 years, and then six states have adopted it in the last four years. So he was able to use this timing to study whether or not sex selection bans have the impact of changing sex ratios. So Arinda, would you like to talk, talk about your findings and describe your study? Sure. So what, what we do in our study is uh, we start with a census. Uh, this is an annual census of all childbirths in the US. Um, the data comes from NCHS, which is the National Center for Health Statistics. And um, what we are trying to do is um, we are taking this to the two uh, years of ban, 1984 in Illinois and 1989 in Pennsylvania. And we're trying to see what happened before and after that. So in other words, I'm trying to see whether uh, you know, there were any changes in the sex ratio after the ban in uh, any of these two states. So the way we do it is we start with a group of states. For example, if I'm doing the Pennsylvania analysis, then I would start with Pennsylvania and four or five uh, of its neighboring states. And then I would take the data set from five years before the ban, uh, before 1989, the uh, five years leading up to that, and five years after 1989, right? And then I would look at the sex ratio in Pennsylvania between the post-ban period and the pre-ban period to see what happened, you know, whether, whether there were any changes. And this is what we call difference one, the first difference. And then there's a second difference, which would be for the rest of the states, which did not see a change in the policy, which did not have a ban on sex abortion during this uh, time period of 10 years. For them, I would also look at the period after 1981, five years, and then five years before 1981. And then I would take the difference between the post period and the pre period for the uh, five or six neighboring states. So this is our second difference. So if I take the difference in difference, then what I would get is basically what happened in Pennsylvania after the ban as compared to before the ban and also in comparison with what happened during the same period in the neighboring states. That will give us a sort of difference in difference um, outcome of the uh, sex abortion ban. So we did do this analysis for uh, the state group of Pennsylvania neighbors and also for Illinois and neighbors, also for a 10 year period uh, um, during 1984, five years before and after. And what we see is, uh, particularly for the Pennsylvania state, state group, um, if you look at the 10 year period as a whole, then among the minorities, so we look at two groups of minorities, um, Chinese because the United States said they are the largest, and all other Asians as another group. Um, among these two minority groups, there is some uh, male bias issue over the 10 year period around 1989. But we don't see any impact of the law, um, you know, 
So there is not much difference, so there is no difference at all, no statistically significant difference between the first period and the period. So in other words, I can say that the ban in um, Pennsylvania was not associated with any group among the minority groups. And then the same can be said for the Illinois and uh, neighboring state groups as well. Thank you, uh, Arindam. Uh, so your study basically shows that there is no evidence, I think, that abortion bans are associated with the sex ratio uh, changes. And the, the next thing that I wanted to point out to you is uh, to flip to Brian. Um, Brian, uh, in states uh, that have recently adopted sex selection bans, the report that we've written points out that the finger is always pointed towards <coughs> India and China as countries where there's imbalanced sex ratios and where sex selection abortions are occurring. Um, could you uh, let us know from the sort of research that, um, that you all have done uh, regarding this? Yes. So this, I think this is one of the central myths of the report is to examine whether or not the focus on India and China as, as the leading countries or two of the only countries in the world that have problems with sex ratios, whether that is accurate. Because it, is, it, is, uh, it has been part of the narrative that's um, been uh, crafted in support of these laws in, in both legislative debates and also in the, in the public debates that surround them. Um, so the, I mean, the first thing is to say that uh, sex ratios are skewed in, in India and China, um, and they are male biased, but they are not the only countries in the world, and in fact they're not the countries in the world that have the most male biased sex ratios. So um, doing some research and using the CIA uh, World Factbook, which, which is a, um, a resource the CIA provides of sort of uh, population and other indicators uh, for countries around the world, according to their most recent, it was just updated, I think, almost last week, so it's pretty recent data. Um, although there, we, there are some concerns as to whether or not we should use CIA or World Bank data, but given that we're in the United States, we thought we would uh, use CIA data. According to the CIA, the country with the highest sex ratio of birth is actually in Europe. Um, there's maybe a caveat to be made uh, because it's the country of Liechtenstein, Liechtenstein, which is a s small country. One of the most wealthiest countries in the world also has one of the um, wealthiest in terms of per capita income. It also has a very uh, restrictive abortion law. It has a sex ratio of birth at of 1.26. And remember the natural range, the so-called natural range of the standard range is 1.03 to 1.07. Um, the country with the next highest sex ratio of birth is in, our, is in the Caucasus, is Armenia. Uh, Azerbaijan also has a sex ratio of birth of 1.12. That's the same sex ratio of birth of India, which is 1.12. Uh, Albania, in southern Europe, in the Caucasus, has a sex ratio of 1.11. Uh, China's ratio is 1.11. So when we take a broader look uh, geographically, we see that India and China uh, are, while they are outliers with regard to the rest of the world, they're in a large group of 13 countries that have sex ratios at birth above the, the standard range. Thank you, Brian. And you uh, traveled to India with uh, Jeff Gilson, a clinic student uh, in the International Human Rights Clinic, to um, meet with people, interview uh, NGOs, interview women. And could you sort of briefly describe your findings and discuss what factors you saw that led to uh, male bias or, or some preference sex selection that are either you know, your observation of how they may be different or not different with uh, respect to the United States. Sure, yeah, so we, uh, in December, uh, I, along with uh, Jeff Wilson, went to India to do some research and the direction, or the, the purpose of the research was really to understand uh, what is called sun preference in India, understand why child sex ratios, which is the ratio that India uses to, to look at the, uh, the number of girls and boys, why those ratios have been declining meaning there's less girls over time, and they have been. So if you look at the Indian census data from 80 or 91, 2001, actually 81, 91, 2001, 2011, the ratios have gotten worse every, every census. Um, so there's a problem in India, and we wanted to understand it more, in part to see whether or not the same problem, uh, or a problem of the same nature exists in the United States. So it was really a kind of comparative analysis. Um, and the one thing that we learned is that there's no one factor that operates in the same way throughout India um, 
with regard to driving some preference or practices of sex selection, which is to say some of the highest, or some of, I'll just you say worst since it's the child sex ratios are measured in an opposite way as sex ratios at birth. Some of the worst child sex ratios are in some of the wealthiest parts of India, in, in, uh, in Delhi, in South Delhi, one of an enclave of highly educated and highly wealthy people um, in relation to India. Uh, so it's not a simple story, but some of the, the things that stood out to us is of course economic opportunities. Girls are often viewed as economic and social liabilities to their families because for a variety of reasons, they, they lack the same economic opportunities and education opportunities that boys have. Um, so families who, families who need, who are concerned about their financial situation prefer to have boys for that reason. Um, costs surrounding marriage in India, da dowry, where the woman's family has to give money to the, the uh, husband's family to allow the marriage to happen is prohibited, but the practice still exists to some extent. Not everywhere, but to some extent. Um, also, marriages are really, really expensive in India. I don't know if all any of you have been to a wedding, but they're amazing, but they're really costly. <laughs> and the, the bride has to bear the cost. And again, this isn't, not everybody follows this tradition, but it, it still is there. The patrilocal system, where the woman leaves the, her house and lives in the, the marital home of her husband is another major concern. So even when you have families who do invest in their, in, in the, in their children, the girls, or wealthy families who, who do allow their, or because of new laws, the property is, uh, is distributed to the girls, they often leave the family, so they're cons they're, it's considered an investment in a child who will leave the family and no longer be a part of the family. Um, so with success, because I don't have much time, I'll kind of just sure. say that when we look at the United States, the United States has a long way to go with regard to gender in, uh, equality, that it's clear. Um, but there, on almost every in index that we have to look at gender equality and participation of women in the workforce and uh, access to education, the United States does considerably well. So a lot of the uh, economic uh, considerations aren't a problem here. One last point on that is that in India, there's no really private and there's no public uh, pension system. So families rely on their sons in, for financial security in old age. Um, in the United States, there are both private and, pension, and uh, public pension systems. That's another major concern. Um, so at the end of the day, what, what we've seen is that there's a big difference between the context in which some preference or sex selection might happen in the US and the context in which it happens in India. And we think that's important, an important part of the debate because India is brought in uh, uh, as an example um, in support of these laws. Great, thank you. So. Um, as we mentioned, India is sort of always mentioned in the legislative history uh, of these laws, and I'm going to turn it over to Kelsey, who uh, had the pleasure of reading every law that's been passed, that has failed, that's in Congress, that I'm sure she enjoyed every minute of it, but now that makes her the world's leading expert in, in these laws, and she would, I'd like her, you to describe um, how it's structured, you know, how do you, in, how do you even enforce the sex selection abortion ban? Who has liabilities? And can you give us a general overview of some of, of the provisions from these laws? Sure, so um, all of these laws prohibit sex selective abortion, but none of them um, actually target the other methods of sex selection that Sujata brought up. Um, so really sex selection could continue to happen even if um, these abortion bans are in place. Um, so the ones that have the liability are mostly medical professionals. Um, most of the laws target medical <coughs> professionals. Um, some laws do say any person, um, so potentially the woman could be liable, um, but mostly they are targeted towards medical professionals, which is problematic because um, healthcare providers may deny access to women um, in the fear of this liability. Um, so we kind of worry that maybe prenatal or abortion services are gonna um, not be provided to women who are seeking an abortion for non-sex selection reasons. Um, then as I mentioned, women um, who receive the abortion um, could potentially be liable under the laws that say that any person could be liable. And um, this is problematic because we found that sometimes there is a coercion aspect to these kinds of abortions when it is a sex selective abortion. Um, maybe the father or the uh, maternal uh, grandparents or the paternal grandparents are the ones that are kind of uh, reinforcing the gender stereotypes and want a male um, grandson or a son. Um, so this is problematic if a woman is not really choosing this type of abortion and then she could potentially be liable. Um, and then a variety of individuals are able to enforce these laws. Um, for civil liability, government officials, the woman upon whom an abortion is performed, the husband or maternal grandparents, and the current or former healthcare provider of the woman 
are able to bring um, either an injunction or a uh, suit for civil damages. Um, this we found kind of problematic because um, allowing the family members to become uh, enforcers of these laws basically brings them into a woman's decision um, to terminate her pregnancy and potentially if the family is unhappy then maybe they might want to sue the woman. Um, and then also the current or former health care providers may not even have been involved in the decision to have an abortion. So it's kind of uh, strange that someone who's completely removed from the decision could potentially enforce civil liability. Thank you. And did you mention South Dakota or Arizona, how they, these laws might be um, enforced? Um, so uh, basically in Arizona, um, a health care professional is uh, required to report known or suspected violations to appropriate law enforcement authorities. So if um, a health care professional thinks that a woman is uh, having a sex selective abortion or wants a sex selective abortion, they are required to report those, um, those abortions to uh, uh, the police or uh, the attorney general, um, which it's hard because how do you know what the true reason for a woman receiving an abortion unless she says, I don't want this female child, you know, which if a woman knows that that's problematic, she's not going to say that. And so we get into kind of stereotyping based on, based on certain ethnicities um, who we doctors might think are those that would sex select. Great. Thank you. Um, and I think in South Dakota, people are required to, physicians are required to ask a battery of questions to get at whether or not, even if someone goes in, anyone who I think goes to get an abortion in South Dakota would have to answer and, these yeah. battery of questions. And the law pending in Florida requires doctors to get a, take an affidavit from a woman uh, to say she's not. Big, and, big and again, this applies to every woman. Um, so. Questions for Miriam. Um, you are working, Miriam's working on the ground in these laws. She's testified in perhaps every state legislature and Congress that, that have considered these laws. So one of the things we've talked about here, proponents of these laws frame these as being necessary to end sun preference in the United States. And they are also uh, widely citing Indian and Chinese people. So for example, even Prenda, which is a federal bill, its introduction says, quote, evidence strongly suggests that some Americans are ex exercising sex selection abortion practices within the United States consistent with discriminatory practices common to their country of origin or the country to which they trace their ancestry. So really my question for you is, uh, Miriam, is, is do, do, are these laws really about Gen, you know, are they primarily motivated to create gender equality and, and just gender discrimination in our country, or not? This could be the shortest answer. <laughs> no, <laughs> absolutely not. And I can um, say this in a in a, a, a little bit of a story because we were flagged. Well, first of all, the National Asian Pacific American Women's Forum, which is uh, my organization, and Shavana Jura Ward, who's sitting there, who's our <coughs> reproductive justice program director. Um, NAPOF has had a position against sun preference uh, since the early 90s as, as an issue that we're concerned about because sun preference is a result of gender inequality, right? Because it, if it didn't matter if you were a girl or boy in this society, why would a parent have a preference one way or the other? So um, in 2008, we got a call from Congressman Trent Frank's office. Mind you, we've never gotten a call from Congressman Trent Franks before, and we've been a women's equality and women's rights movement since 1996. Right? So an out of the blue call from Trent Franks to both my organization and Sujatha's organization saying, hey, we have this bill we think you will be interested in supporting. And the first thought was like, well, that's interesting. Who are you? <laughs> you know, like, uh, And why haven't we ever worked uh, together before? So it became really clear once we uh, looked at the legislative language and even the bill title. So the federal bill initially when it was proposed was called the Susan B. Anthony Frederick Douglass Prenatal Non-Discrimination Act. <laughs> Says it all. And the first line in the kind of legislative findings piece was, sex discrimination is terrible, and race discrimination is terrible, which are all things we agree with, right? Sex discrimination and race discrimination is terrible. But it becomes really clear when you look through the bill, what it does is criminalize doctors who provide abortions, right? And when you look at the legislative records of Trent Franks and all the other co-sponsors for this legislation, they are clearly staunch anti-abortion um, Congress people, right? Like that they're, Trent Franks in particular is on record as saying that's his 
That's his mission in life, right, is to end abortion in this country. Um, on the contrary, these are not guys who even voted for VAWA. Do you know what I mean? Or these are not guys who voted for the Civil Rights Act, right? So the hypocrisy, by contrast, of all of a sudden proclaiming to, to, to raise, to hold the flag up for sex and race, against sex and race discrimination, um, was extremely, in our opinion, hypocritical. Which is why, uh, in our advocacy, we've really called these wolf and sheep's clothing um, laws. And uh, the same pattern has uh, replicated itself in throughout the states, right? So wherever it's proposed, um, it's largely been uh, Republican anti-abortion legislators who are putting it, and then getting to say that they're doing it for feminist reasons or anti-racist reasons. Um, so that's some context for the longer story. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, and some of our research, which uh, uh, Bill Watson has done, has actually he's looked at voting records for all of, the, all of these laws in the, the last six years that have been passed, uh, so six states. And 92% of the Republicans in those states voted for the bans. Um, whereas uh, in most states, we had very few Democrats voting for the bans except in two states which uh, had, we saw 30%, uh, Oklahoma and South Dakota, where I think generally uh, the Democrats even tend to be um, uh, anti, are, are no, uh, have been known to be voting on, on uh, anti-abortion issues. Can I add on a little bit to, uh, to also know that um, in the state states that, it, that has passed in recent time, um, five of those states are uh, states that have seen enormous growth in the Asian American community. Arizona saw a 91% population growth over the last census. Um, and in each of the other states, about over 70% growth, except for Kansas. I don't know why people don't want to go to Kansas. <laughs> uh, but even in South Dakota, for example, grew 70% over the last census. And much of the rhetoric, uh, besides being anti-abortion, is also anti-immigrant, uh, with a particular anti-Asian flavor, right? And in the South Dakota legislative fight that we just lost, um, legislators got up and said, these Asians are, I'm paraphrasing, these Asians are coming, and we know they don't value girls the same way we do here, and therefore we just have to stop this practice before it even starts, right? Um, so really, uh, the, the sex-selective abortion ban strategy is really on the backs of Asian American women and based on harmful stereotypes of our community, and I would say also uh, xenophobia, right? Like these communities are growing ever more diverse, and instead of welcoming immigrants, and particularly Asian American immigrants, they, they are actively, um, I say, uh, you know, you know uh, sending an unwelcome message with these kinds of bans. Thank you, Maria. So um, now I'm going to switch to Arindam. Arindam, can you hear me? Yes. OK. So uh, the data, data, the most important thing we care about here at the University of Chicago. So the key empirical study on this was released in 2008 by Columbia economists uh, no, uh, called Ed, Edlund and Almond. Uh, they have sort of populated the field. Every study, every legislature cites their study. Every group that, are, that uh, supports these bans cites their study, they showed, uh, using 15-year-old data now, that foreign-born Chinese, Korean, and Indians, <coughs> when they have two girls, they are disproportionately likely to have a boy, more likely than comparing them to the, na the American national um, uh, sex ratio. So. Um, we uh, uh, worked on uh, with with our economists, who's uh, Arindam as well as Alexander, who's not here, to uh, review this data, replicate the study, and update it using the 2007 to 2011 American Community Survey, and have found some interesting results that I would like uh, Arindam to describe. Okay, so you know, uh, picking up where uh, Shita left off, the main focus of all the discussion that's been around the data. Um, in Amman and Ajahn's study was that particular, you know, this narrow group of uh, foreign-born Chinese, Indian, and Korean families could have had two girls before. And then looking at the third birth, they found that the next issue was already being biased, right? 
So, you know, to begin with, we're starting with a really small percentage of the, even the Asian population. Um, now, when we reviewed the new data, 2007, 2011, and data, we find that this holds up, but what was not highlighted in previous studies uh, was that if you look at uh, the first birth among the foreign-born Chinese, uh, Indian, and Korean families, then the sex ratio in the first birth is actually much better or much less male bias as compared to uh, U.S. born whites in the ACSB. So in other words, they're actually having more girls in their first birth than our white Americans, this community, right? Exactly. So if you look, for example, Indians, uh, the sex ratio at the first birth is exactly one, which means they're having the same number of boys and girls as compared to 1.05, which means U.S. whites are having more boys at the first birth. And then when we go on farther, when we look at uh, the overall, you know, take the end of the set, forget about birth parities, first birth, the second birth, the third birth, look at overall, then we would see that in the overall data set, foreign-born Chinese, Indians, and Koreans, they actually have a sex ratio at birth of 1.02, which is lower than the white sex ratio of 1.06 in the data. What this means is, uh, uh, is this uh, minority groups are actually having more girls on an average or on the whole compared to U.S. born whites. So we sort of estimated, uh, you know, if you take the entire population of all types of Asians, Chinese, Indian, and Korean, and if you compare that group with a similar sized U.S. born white uh, family group, then we would find that the Asian group is actually having almost 3,200 more girls um, across all birth parities as compared to the U.S. white group. Great. So uh, that is, I think, uh, very helpful and very, uh, you know, critical to know what the, the ha how we should really understand the data uh, and what's actually happening. We sort of laid out what we think are the six myths, our responses to them, and we hope that this report will really reframe the discussion and debate that's going on, because I think that currently it's a very, the narrative is, uh, as, as we have said, that Indians and Chinese people, they are sexist, they have sexist practices, they come to the US, they replicate them in a widespread basis, it's horrible, we need to stop it, and you know, therefore better gender equality. And I think that messaging has, not, and as we've tried to show you, that that's not necessarily all true.